Caution. The AJ and Quill Show contains D&D content and is intended for a D&D audience. And, besides that, they're really weird. Hi everyone, welcome to Total Party Quill. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood tiefling, AJ, and this is my fearless friend, Quill the Dragon. Say hi, Quill. Greetings, puny humans. Prepare to absorb the knowledge Quill will dispense with his mighty jaws. Now recently, Wizards of the Coast announced that they were going to be putting out a new adventure called Icewind Dale Rhyme with the Frost Maiden. And to help get everybody ready for that adventure, we're going to be doing monster statistics for creatures that we're pretty sure you're going to find inside those adventures. So what are we covering today? Question. What would you be if you were an unholy creation that survived only on subsisting on the vital energy and life force of another living creature? My ex-girlfriend. <laughs> no, no, you'd be a vampire! Vampires are an iconic and classic Dungeons and Dragons monster. They evoke fear and gothic themes, and we're going to be covering them in our video today. We know from the released material that there is at least one vampire knoll inside the adventure. But, let's not waste any more time. You got questions, we got answers. Let's get vampire-y. Good evening. I want to count your cookies. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. One, two, three. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Nom, 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 nom. Uh-oh. That's right, vampires. Now, we're not going to be getting into the lore too much because I think most people out there who play Dungeons and Dragons are pretty aware of what a vampire is. They seem to permeate our pop culture left, right, and center. But the notion of vampirism has existed for at least a millennium and has crossed multiple cultures. Mesopotamia, the ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek, and the ancient Romans all had folk tales that had to deal with evil creatures that could be considered a precursor to vampires. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary says that the word vampire first appeared in English in 1734. It was in a travel log titled Travels of Three English Gentlemen. But the more modern, sophisticated, ritzy vampire can all be more attributed to the writer John Palladori back in 1819. In folklore, a vampire is an undead creature that subsists on feeding on the vital essence of another living creature. Now, generally, this is in the form of blood, but that's not always the case. Now, in Dungeons & Dragons specifically, vampires are a boss-level creature, but they tend to get taken for granted because they're in our pop culture so much, and we see them so often that we don't really give them enough credence inside the game. But vampires have existed inside of our pop culture for, well, almost 100 years, really. Nosferatu in 1922, Bela Lugosi in 1931, Bram Stoker, John Carpenter, Marvel Comics with Blade, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Twilight, Underworld, Interview with a Vampire in 1994, Queen of the Damned in 2007, True Blood, Vampire Diaries, Castlevania, Monster High, Sesame Street, Scooby-Doo, and Sherlock Holmes, as well as other role-playing games like Vampire the Masquerade. And that's just to name a few. Vampires are kind of everywhere, and we've seen a lot of them in the last few years. And something that we haven't covered is the, the lore surrounding Vlad the Impaler. Vlad III, or Vlad the Impaler, was a ruler in Wallachia. He is considered one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history and a national hero of Romania. Now, Bram Stoker's book Dracula was published in 1897, and he was the first one to connect Vlad the Impaler with Dracula and vampirism. Bram Stoker was said to have his attention drawn by the blood-sucking vampires in Romanian folklore. Unfortunately, he didn't really know much about the history of Vlad the Impaler. According to Elizabeth Miller, Bram Stoker borrowed the name and scraps of miscellaneous information about the history of Wallachia and wrote it into his book. Now, vampires inside Dungeons & Dragons are an undead creature. Now, something that you need to know about a creature if you're going to understand how it fights in combat is you're going to need to know its motivations for why it wants to fight. Undead in general are driven by what we would call a compulsion. Which is really more like an addiction. A ghost compulsion or addiction is that it wants to take care of unfinished business that it had while it was alive. Right, and simple undead like skeletons and zombies, their compulsion or addiction is just following the commands of whatever or whoever created them. Vampires, by comparison, 
have a compulsion to feed. And this compulsion to feed on blood or the living essence of a creature is exactly like an addiction, and you should treat it like it is for the vampire. Now, vampires can be found in the 5th edition Monster Manual on pages 295 to page 298. The stat blocks cover both a vampire spawn and a true vampire. And vampire spawn are just other kinds of lesser vampires with a lower CR that a true vampire can create with its bite. Now, an actual vampire is a CR 13 medium undead creature, and it's a shape changer. Now, we're going to cover both inside this video, so it's quite a lot, but we're going to start with vampire spawn because they're what you're more than likely going to encounter first. Vampire spawn have high physical statistics. That's a 16 in each strength, constitution, and dexterity. And they have an above average charisma of 12. Now, vampire spawn are proficient in both dexterity and wisdom saving throws. Along with their high constitution score, this makes them pretty resilient. Essentially, they cover the big three saves. Vampires are proficient in perception and stealth. This kind of leads to the idea of them being more stealthy, predatory hunters. Vampires have resistance to both necrotic damage and damage from normal, non-magical attacks. Vampires spawn have a dark vision out to 60 feet, and true vampires can double that. It's important to note that a vampire spawn regenerates 10 hit points if they aren't in direct sunlight or running water. Although being splashed with holy water or hit with radiant damage will suppress this regenerating ability. They have a spider climb ability, and they have the standard vampire weaknesses. Now, the standard vampire weaknesses are what we pretty much associate with vampire weaknesses from pop culture and movies and television shows. That's forbiddance from entering a residence without permission, being damaged by running water, being killed by a stake through the heart, and being damaged by sunlight. Now, a vampire spawn has two attacks. They have a claw and a bite. They also have a multi-attack that lets them do both. Right, but there's a special case. They can only do their bite attack inside of a multi-attack once, but they could use their claw attack once or twice if they wanted. This means they can do two claw attacks with their multi-attack, or they can do one claw and one bite attack. Now whenever you see something inside the stat blocks that's limited, like the vampire's bite for example, that's because it's powerful and they have to limit how many times you can use it, which means that you should probably use it as much as you possibly can. The bite attack doesn't just subtract hit points from its opponent. It also restores hit points to the vampire spawn. The bite has a precondition that the victim either be grappled, incapacitated, restrained, or willing. Right. Luckily enough, though, the vampire's claw attack has a writer under it where instead of doing damage on a hit, it can just choose to grapple the target instead. This is kind of like a combo attack that you would use inside of a video game where one ability sets up the next one and the second one does more damage or puts a condition or something extra. But how do we put all that information together? How do vampire spawn behave in combat? Now, as we said, a vampire spawn's proficiency in both perception and stealth indicate that they are an active hunter. They stalk their prey and ambush them from a place of hiding. Vampires are strictly nocturnal due to their aversion to sunlight. They stalk weaker, isolated prey and they won't attack a group larger than them in numbers directly. Now the combat encounter begins with the vampire spawn stalking the PCs to ambush them. They're going to do their best to attack from hiding and surprise your characters. Now a vampire spawn is going to use its multi-attack once it gets into melee range. Logically, it's going to use its claw attack first to try to grapple any creature so that it can set up its bite. So if it manages to hit with its claw attack, it can choose to do no damage and instead grapple the target. The difficulty class on this grapple is 13. So Vampire Spawn move to melee range and multi-attack with their action, with the intent to grapple the target. And if that grapple is successful, the Vampire Spawn is then going to bite the target. On subsequent rounds, it keeps biting the grappled victim once per turn. Now if the Vampire Spawn misses with its claw attack and fails to grapple the target, it'll keep trying to grapple the target unless the target has proficiency in either athletics or acrobatics. After attacking the target, the vampire spawn will know if the target has this proficiency. And as a DM, it's good to keep a note of which of your player characters has proficiency in either athletics or acrobatics, so that you don't have to ask mid-combat. Now, if they are proficient in either athletics or acrobatics, the vampire spawn is going to know it, and instead of trying to grapple and bite them, it's just going to say, to hell with this, and it's going to use only claw attacks just to destroy that character. It can always bite them when they're down. However, if the 
character doesn't have proficiency in athletics or acrobatics, the vampire spawn is going to keep using its claw attack to attempt to grapple the creature. A note, though, is that at any point, if a character has athletics or acrobatics proficiency, and the vampire spawn somehow gets advantage on its attack roll, it will attempt to grapple that creature again. Right, and really just because, why not? It has advantage, so it may as well try. A vampire spawn, once it has a grappled opponent, will attempt to flee with its dinner, using its movement each round to drag the target towards a hiding place. Now with a grappled creature, a vampire spawn can move 15 feet. But they might also choose to decide to go straight up a wall using their spider climb ability, in which case they can only move 7 feet. This is because their spider climb ability does not give them a climbing speed. So while they're climbing, their movement is reduced. And this little factoid was confirmed by Mike Merrills on Twitter. Wait a second! That's kind of confusing. How do you move 7 feet when each grid on your battle mat represents 5 feet? I think we might need to get a little meta adjacent and explain that. Ah, uh, yes. Who doesn't like a good story about a grid? Why well, don't mind telling you that in my uni days, some of the other boys and I got together for a little bit of experimentation using a hex grid. But nobody wants to hear about my college hex years. Let's get on to the matter at hand. Movement. On a typical combat grid inside Dungeons & Dragons, each grid square represents five feet of movement. Now, in order to move into an adjacent grid, you need to have at least one full square of movement remaining. And this is even if the square you intend on moving to is adjacent but diagonal to the square you currently occupy. So, logically, if each square on your battle grid represents five feet of movement, you would need at least five feet remaining in your own movement to enter that square. Now, do keep in mind that things like difficult terrain, moving through another creature's square, or moving while prone, cause every foot that you do move to cost one extra foot. This would mean that if you were entering an adjacent square that was also considered to be difficult terrain, it would cost you 10 feet of movement. So you would need to have at least 10 feet of movement remaining to be able to enter that square. Something else to remember is that while climbing or swimming, each foot of movement costs you one extra foot of movement, or two if it is also difficult terrain, unless you also have a climbing or a swimming speed, respectively. This means that if every square on your grid represented five feet, and you were climbing, and the square you wished to enter was also difficult terrain, you would need at least 15 feet to enter that square. Right, so a vampire spawn with a grappled victim that it's biting, who decides to flee up a wall using its spider climb ability, can only move five feet per turn. Now, if a vampire spawn is attacked while it has another opponent grappled, the vampire spawn will use its first claw attack against that attacker. Then, it will use its bite against its grappled opponent. Right, and this is because of its insane bloodlust or its addiction to getting that blood. It can't not bite a creature that it has in its mouth. It's just compelled to. So while it will attack with its claw, it's still going to keep feeding. Vampire spawn don't really get the idea of delayed gratification. Now, a vampire spawn that has entirely drained its victim to unconsciousness will disengage from combat and leave. This is because its hunger has now been satiated, it's done feeding, so it's just going to leave combat. If it doesn't need to use the disengage action to prevent any opportunity attacks, it instead uses the dash action to get away as fast as possible. Even though a vampire spawn is an undead creature, because of their f impulse to feed and their addiction to life essence and blood, we are going to say that they suffer a morale failure once they've reached one quarter of their hit points. This is because they have a desire to continue living so they can feed. So once a vampire spawn reaches 20 hit points, it's going to disengage and flee from combat as fast as it can back to its lair. This is unless it has direct commands from its master to continue fighting and kill the targets. Right, a vampire spawn under the control of a master that is told to attack and kill these creatures won't stop. And in that case, it'll just move on to the next victim once one is drained, probably one of them that attacked it while it was feeding. But that's a vampire spawn. That's a CR5 undead creature. There's a much beefier CR13 vampire 
and they're the ones that make the vampire spawn. This will be your boss level creature. Vampires have the same attributes as a vampire spawn, but they also have the shape changer, legendary resistance, misty escape, charm, and children of the night features. Now for stats, a vampire has amazingly high statistics. Their lowest is their wisdom with a 15. Plus, a vampire also has three legendary actions. Legendary actions allow a vampire to move, grapple, and bite on another creature's turn. But a vampire being a boss creature, you have to treat it differently. Vampires themselves are smart, calculating victims. Uh, think like Grand Admiral Thrawn or Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes. A true vampire values its existence more than it values feeding. Right, and they're pretty picky about the targets they choose. They tend to go after people who either won't be missed or won't be cared about if they do go missing. In a fantasy setting, this would include people like beggars, homeless, burglars, drug addicts, hapless watchmen, drunks, and prostitutes. And a vampire is very secretive about its true identity. Usually they work through familiars or intermediaries to accomplish most of their day-to-day -day tasks. Although, unfortunately, due to proximity and intimacy with these either servants or familiars, Eventually, the vampire will have to give in to its urges and more than likely will either bite them and turn them into a vampire spawn or just kill them and feed on them. Now, because vampires are so secretive about their identities and their lairs, the player characters will only encounter a vampire outside of its lair if it chooses so. Right, and discovering a vampire's real identity and the location of its lair is the kind of thing that can encompass an entire campaign across multiple tiers of play. Now, a high-level vampire might decide to either taunt or tease low-level player characters and parties. They'll swoop in out of nowhere, they'll attack them for absolutely no reason, leave them almost dead, and then just flee. If you've read the Minsk Baldur's Gate comic books where they encounter Strahd, he does exactly this. Right, and a high-level vampire might even do this several times over the course of the campaign just to mess with the players. But vampires are smart. It will only do this if it is considered an easy encounter for the vampire. Right, this means if you want to reverse engineer that a little bit, if the party taking on the vampire in their current state would be considered a deadly encounter, then that's when the vampire will do this. You can use the build encounter mechanics on page 82 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to help you figure this out. Now, eventually, the goal is to kill the vampire. But in order to do that, they're going to have to find its lair. But a vampire's lair, like Castle Strahd, has multiple layers of security in place. Vampires aren't stupid. Right, and by security I mean layers of security, so uh, moats, battlements, walls, traps, locked doors, human servants, guards, lesser undead, vampire spawn that it's made, and even its children of the night. But actually, that's a good segue. Let's talk about the children of the night special feature that the vampires have for a second. A vampire can magically summon 2d4 swarms of bats or rats, provided that the sun isn't up. Or, while outdoors, a vampire can summon 3d6 wolves instead. The called creatures arrive in 1d4 rounds, acting as allies of the vampire. The beasts remain for one hour, or until the vampire dies or dismisses them as a bonus action. Now it takes 1d4 with an average of two rounds for these creatures even to show up. It's not very conducive to a combat ability because most combat in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition is designed around lasting three rounds. So that means the children of the night that the vampire summon might not even show up until after the battle is over. Now to this extent, we're just going to say that a vampire with any kind of knowledge of the player characters or somebody else attacking it is going to preemptively summon its children of the night. They last for an hour anyway. Now, on average, that will summon either five swarms or ten wolves if they're outdoors. If your party is an appropriate level to be fighting this vampire, then wolves and swarms of bats or rats aren't really going to be high enough level to challenge them in any significant way. This means what they're really there for is to mess up the action economy. These creatures are summoned to interfere with the characters, to make them waste their actions attacking the creatures or moving around them so that they're not actively attacking the vampire. Think of them much more as a way to try to frustrate the player characters. Actions spent dealing with the summoned creatures is less actions directed at the vampire itself. Now, if the PCs got cocky for some reason and decided to go after this vampire when they're not really prepared for it, then the vampire is just going to go for the kill. This is to punish the player's arrogance for believing they could take on the vampire. 
So this means if that the player character is in their current state fighting the vampire would consider it to be a deadly encounter, it's just going to go for the kill. A vampire would delight in turning your player characters all into obedient vampire spawn lackeys. And if your players get kind of caught with this, it's also a stepping stone into another adventure where, as vampire spawn that are newly created, they're trying to either cure themselves or break free of their master's compulsion or kill their master. Just because all your players got killed by the vampire and turned into vampire spawn doesn't mean you have to stop the adventure. Maybe even a little vampire the masquerade could help you out in this. But we're going to assume that the player characters are an appropriate level to be taking on this vampire and that they've gone through the vampire's lair and subsequent layers of security to reach the vampire. Now, an encounter with a true vampire begins in a very interesting way. It starts with a polite greeting and some stimulating conversation. A vampire wants to size up its opponents, and it relishes the pageantry of terror and their own superiority. A true vampire wants to find out what the players want, why they are there, and if they can be bought off somehow. Right, a true vampire understands delayed gratification. It knows that avoiding combat now could mean years of undisturbed feeding. Unlike Vampire Spawn, it's okay with the delayed gratification of not feeding so that it can continue to live. Now, during the conversation, the vampire will be courteous, but more than likely arrogant. A little conceited as well. They're going to keep the PCs talking for as long as possible. The vampire might even offer, say, alternative courses of action that could be mutually beneficial to both the vampire and the player characters. But during the whole conversation, it will keep its eyes and ears wide open for any PC shenanigans or attempts to sneak attack it from behind. Right, so why the conversation? Why start combat this way? Is the vampire just really lonely? Does it miss talking to people? No, it's a trick. The vampire is tricking you. It's using this whole conversation to figure out which is the most weak-willed PC. That means which player character has the lowest wisdom score. And with an intelligence of 17, the vampire is going to be able to figure this out pretty accurately during the conversation. Now as a DM, this just means know which of your player characters have what statistics for their wisdom. And if you have any elf or half-elf characters that are resistant to the charm effect, just give them a blanket plus 5 to their wisdom save to account for this. Once you know these numbers, whichever player characters have the lowest wisdom scores are the ones the vampire is now going to attempt to charm. Now, we're going to cover something fun that I like to call Dungeon Master Subterfuge. That's when you tell your players to roll or do something, but they're really doing it for a completely different reason. At some point during a roleplay conversation, when it would make sense to do so, have the players make a group check. Right, and this could be for something like perception or insight. And... Have the vampire roll a d20 along with the characters. Now, the, regardless of what you tell them they're rolling for, here's what's really happening. The vampire is making a stealth check to use its charm against the character with the lowest wisdom save without being caught. The target is making a wisdom saving throw against the charm, and everyone else is making a wisdom perception check to determine if they've spotted the charm. It's good to have a note somewhere on your Dungeon Master screen of the PC's relevant ability modifiers and scores. That way you don't have to ask them what the, the numbers are in the middle of combat. Now why do all this? What's the vampire really trying to do? At some point during the natural conversation, the vampire is going to slip in either a seemingly ironic or sarcastic quip. Now in context, it's going to seem completely normal. But when taken literally, it's actually a command for whichever player character it charmed to attack or do something. Blah blah blah. How rude of you. Why if one of my party decided to speak that way to my guest, I would simply chop his head off. Right, exactly like that. But as a DM, you can have a lot of fun with this. And it's important to note that the vampire is going to try and charm as many player characters as it can during this conversation. Right, if it thinks it has a decent shot of getting away with it. Now, eventually, at some point, the PCs are either going to Either offend the vampire. Vampires won't suffer any rude or disrespectful behavior during the conversation. Right, and accusing a vampire of trying to charm one of your party is very rude to them. Or, number two, the player characters are simply going to get sick of this drawn-out conversation and attack anyway. No, a vampire doesn't go immediately for the attack. Instead, it takes the dodge action and allows the PCs to come to it. 
Right, and it's doing this because it's going to assess their combat skills. Vampires are intelligent, and during the fight, it's going to be able to recognize what the player characters are capable of. But it won't know it innately, it has to do it during combat. It needs to see what they're capable of. Any player character that comes within melee reach and attacks the vampire, the vampire will use its unarmed strike legendary action to attack that PC at the end of its turn. Much like Straw did if you read that Minsk Baldur's Gate comic book. If a second PC engages in melee combat with the vampire, it does the exact same thing, using its legendary action to attack the creature at the end of that creature's turn. Right, although if this happens a third time in combat, instead of attacking with its legendary action, the vampire is going to use its move legendary action to disengage from combat without suffering any attacks of opportunity and back up as far away from the players as it can. After this first round of combat, the vampire has made its decision on what it's going to do for the rest of combat. If it's going to flee, or if it's going to attack the characters. Think of it like a sick game of cat and mouse, with the vampire playing with its food. If the vampire decided to go for the attack, it's going to act the exact same way as a vampire spawn. Which is why we count the spawn first. Having assessed the player characters, it's going to attack the one with the lowest athletics or acrobatic score within reach of its movement, but it will ignore any charmed player characters. Now the one difference between a vampire and vampire spawn in its attack is if a vampire has grappled a creature and it's biting it, and another character comes and attacks the vampire, it will use both of its claw attacks in its multi-attack. It won't attack and then try to drain the victim. This is because vampires understand delayed gratification. It has the character grappled so it can use both of its attacks against any opponent. Right, and a vampire in that case is going to use its legendary action to bite its victim instead. This is to try to finish the character off even quicker. Now, a real vampire isn't going to bite a victim and then try to drag them away to a hiding spot. It's not trying to flee the fight, it's trying to end the fight. Now a vampire that is reduced to half its hit points will flee combat. Now we call a creature that's reduced to half its hit points bloodied. This is a carryover from 4th edition, and it's just nomenclature that we use. Now if the vampire at half hit points believe that it's somehow outmatched by the players, or if the players seem to know how to kill the vampire outright, then it's just going to completely flee from combat at this point. This means that if the players have used holy water or radiant attacks against the vampire, and it's at half its hit points or lower, it's just going to flee to its lair. But if the vampire doesn't believe that it's overmatched, or if the players don't exhibit any knowledge of how to destroy the vampire, which means they're not using radiant attacks, they don't have wooden stakes, they're not trying to use sunlight or running water, the vampire decides to retreat instead of fleeing back to its lair. It will use its shape changer ability to become a bat and fly out of the room. Right, but like the conversation, this is a trick. The vampire is fooling the PCs into thinking that it ran away, when in reality, the second it was out of sight, it transformed back into mist, and it's going to stalk the player characters. Now, in its mist form, it's going to follow the player characters, stalking them until an appropriate time to rematerialize as a vampire and whisper commands to whatever player characters are still charmed by the vampire. It's going to tell them to either attack its friends, or to flee and hide from combat. This would reduce the, the number of players the vampire is going to have to face, which would change the difficulty of the encounter. After which the vampire is going to engage whatever player characters are left to combat, and it's going to go for the kill. Now a vampire will use its legendary resistance every time it fails a saving throw. Now vampire saving throw modifiers are really good, and this isn't going to be happening very often, so there's really no point in saving its legendary resistances for later. Now remember, no self-respecting vampire has just one lair. If it thinks that the player characters or whoever's hunting it knows where one of its lairs is, it's going to go to a different one. Now vampires are very aware of their own weaknesses. In our home campaign, the vampire we were facing, Arthur Moreland, who's in Waterdeep, spent years researching vampire weaknesses and how to combat them. In combat, a vampire is going to stay away from any player character that does radiant damage to it. And if it can't stay away from them, it's going to try to grapple that character instead. Much like me back in high school, it's going to attempt to eat its problems. Killing a vampire isn't as simple as reducing it to zero hit points. A vampire outside of its resting place when reduced to zero hit points turns into mist instead of falling unconscious. It must then reach its resting place where it reverts to its vampire form and is paralyzed. Now, after one hour in this paralyzed form, a vampire will regain one hit point and is no longer paralyzed. 
This is the window for the feces to find the vampire in its lair and stake it to death. And that's about it. That's really all you need to know about running a vampire combat. Remember, they're thematic. They're meant to be over the top and gothic. Think of like a smart movie villain or any of the horror movies that you relate vampires with. They're supposed to invoke fear, make the player characters feel helpless and confused. They're not supposed to know what's going on or what's happening. Vampires keep them on their toes and they're smart about staying alive. If you can call being a vampire alive. A vampire at half its hit points is going to suffer a morale failure and leave combat if it's overmatched or if it doesn't think it's going to win. They have a heightened survival instinct and they're smart enough to know when to leave. But that also means they're smart enough to know how to get revenge and vampires are very patient. But that's about it. We hope you enjoy using vampires in the upcoming adventure Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Although in that adventure it's going to be a, a Noel vampire which is super cool. And we'd like to offer our most humble apologies to the delightful Mr. Chris Perkins. We're sorry, bud. We just couldn't fit you on the air today. We wanted to get you, but we ran out of time. And don't forget to tune in next week when our special guest will be the delightful Miss Erin M. Evans, author of the Brimstone Angels series. Terrific author. And she explains warlocks really well. But now it's time for Quill's joke of the day. Quill? No joke today. Instead, we're going to be doing a public service announcement. We are? Yes. All right. Now we go live to our correspondent in Pennsylvania, Matty Daytona, with his public service announcement. Oh, hello. The name's Daytona. Batty Daytona. And as you can see from my cowboy hat and trademark toothpick, I'm clearly a regular human guy. I ail from Tucson, Arizona, but I moved to Pennsylvania because it sounds like Transylvania. And I think we know that sounds cool. And I'll tell you something. Vampires aren't real. We are living in dangerous times, in a dangerous world, and there's no point worrying about us, I, I mean vampires, being out there when they simply don't exist. So be safe. And if you're going out into the sun as we real humans like to do, always remember to wear a face mask with your blood type clearly printed on the front. And don't forget to make sure you wash your neck thoroughly for 20 seconds before going out. I mean hands. This has been a public service announcement from the Anti-Vampire Association. Because all us real humans are in this together. So go out there, but be safe. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to having my one human alcohol. Have a good night. This has been Batty Daytona. Back to you. That was awesome. Thanks for stopping by, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye. Bye. Yeah, 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 yeah.